So I'd like to lay out the analytic standards that are highlighted in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence's ICD-203, or Intelligence Community Directive-203. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of background on this uh, policy document to begin with, and then I'd like to read through um, the sort of major elements in it. And I'm, I'm actually going to read through them because they are sort of directives, um, and it's good to get the wording precise, but I'd also like to sort of intersperse that with uh, a little bit of commentary on some of the things I think are happening when you read between the lines and some of the things that are happening in terms of the backstory and the context around why this document was created. So ICD-203 was drafted in the wake of, of two intelligence failures that were fairly major and, and prompted some major soul searching by the intelligence community. So the first of those was the failure to anticipate uh, the terrorist attacks of September 11th. The second was uh, the assessment on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, uh, that the Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction when in fact it did not. And because of those failures, the intelligence committee was tasked with doing an overview of uh, tradecraft and how analysts work. And the Office of the Director of National Intelligence created this unified set of standards for analysts that would cut across the entire intelligence community. So an analyst in the Department of Defense and an analyst in the CIA would all be working with sort of the same framework for what would they be producing, how they would be producing it, what would be sort of the, the hallmarks of good analysis. And this would allow for additional specialization, but there would be a common starting point, a unified foundation. Uh, the initial draft of this was released in 2007 and then it was updated in 2015. So I'll be going through the 2015 update. So the first standard laid out in ICD-203 is that analysis should be objective. And again, I'll, I'll read the exact wording because the exact wording is important, but then we'll talk about it a little bit. So analysts must perform their functions with objectivity and with awareness of their own assumptions and reasoning. They must employ reasoning techniques and practical mechanisms that reveal and mitigate bias. Analysts should be alert to the influence of existing analytic positions or judgments and must consider alternative perspectives and contrary information. Analysis should be uh, should not be unduly constrained by previous judgments when new developments indicate a modification is necessary. And so there's a couple different components of this that I want to flag for you. Um, the first of which is that they're talking about this idea that you're supposed to perform your job objectively. Um, and I think most people would sort of put as the opposite of objective bias. But when you actually read sort of the wording, bias is not treated as something that is part of an analyst's reasoning. Um, it's talked about in the following sentence, it's not sort of in the gray, as something that exists sort of out there in the abstract uh, that an analyst should be aware of, that bias exists without saying, and I think for, for bureaucratic reasons, without saying our analysts bring bias with them to the table because that would imply that something is wrong with analysts rather than recognizing that analysts are just human beings. Uh, so that's, I think, an interesting bureaucratic thing to note in this initial language. The second thing I would note is that there's a prescribed method for avoiding bias. Um, it's by using specific reasoning techniques and specifically reasoning techniques that consider alternative perspectives and contrary information. So it's kind of pointing us in the direction of using uh, the analysis of competing hypotheses, method, or similar structured analytic techniques. And then there's a final piece I'll flag about this is that analysts should be alert to the influence of existing analytic positions or judgments um, and should not be unduly constrained by previous judgments. So I think there's, there's a sense of don't just simply defer to the past, be aware and update uh, promptly when new information warrants it. Okay, so the second uh, factor laid out in ICD-203 is that analysis should be independent of political consideration. And so analytic assessments must not be distorted by nor shaped for advocacy of a particular audience agenda or policy viewpoint. Analytic ju judgments must not be influenced by the force of preference for a particular policy. And again, I think this is bureaucratically worded in a very careful way because you don't want to say our analysts are biased, they're bringing their own bias to the table and their, their own political agenda to the table because that would imply that you know, analysts aren't behaving in a professional manner. Um, on the other hand, you don't really want to say that the political pressure is coming from outside that it's policymakers who are 
pushing the intelligence community to say things that maybe aren't true because that's encouraging your analysts to not be responsive to requests from the policy community uh, that would be normal as part of the feedback process that you should be having uh, in the intelligence cycle where policymakers say, you know, what you're giving me isn't as helpful as it could be. Can you please adjust to make your intelligence products more useful to me? And this is not something that I think is new. This is a, a age old problem with the intelligence community, how to balance um, a, a sort of professionalism and, and your, your professional assessment against political pressure. Uh, and th there's a couple different views on this. So the ideal um, that David T. Moore cites uh, is a quote from, from Will Pitt in which Pitt basically says, the CIA should be the one place in Washington that policymakers can turn to and get the unvarnished truth, right? That that's where you go, you'll get the truthful answer. They're not gonna spin you and, and push a particular agenda. And that's the value added of the intelligence community that there's not that political agenda built into the analysis. On the other hand, in reality, I'm not sure that that's actually what the intelligence community can do, even if it was inspi aspiring to do that. And part of that is because there's not like a place where we keep the truth, right? There's not a binder that has all the truth in it that we can just sort of hand to policymakers and say, there, there you go. A lot of times intelligence judgments rely upon uncertainty and sort of figuring out how to navigate that uncertainty. There, there are problems where there's a lot of information missing, where we have to make assumptions. They're oftentimes wicked problems where the complexity is really beyond the ability of people to, to, to work with and manage. And so what we're oftentimes giving is not the truth. We're giving, this is my best judgment given the information I have and how I've been thinking about this. And that can be problematic from this perspective of not allowing any sort of bias to creep in to your analysis because it is, at the end of the day, interacting with our sort of subjective, how do we navigate this, this messiness? Um, the other piece I'll add is that policymakers are oftentimes skeptical of intelligence. Um, and part of that is that they have their own biases, they have their own pre-existing beliefs, they have their own sort of desires to, to reach particular ends. They have their own sources of information and they tend to think they're pretty smart people. And so when you're presenting intelligence to a policymaker, that policymaker might not choose to, to use that information. And that's fine. Um, there's sort of an age old sort of adage that a policymaker is inclined to use intelligence the way a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than for illumination. Uh, if I were going to extend that metaphor a little bit further in this context, um, that's fine. <laughs> the intelligence community's job is to provide the illumination. Um, if policymakers choose to not value that illumination, but instead value the support that they can get from a intelligence product, that's fine, that's their prerogative. Nothing requires a policymaker to do what the intelligence community, or to, to, to listen to or react to what the intelligence community is providing. Um, the problem comes in when the policymaker says, I want a light post there, and points down the street where you know there's no need for illumination or there's nothing to illuminate, and you're being asked to provide a lamp post that is going to be used explicitly for political support. I think that's kind of what they're getting at, particularly in the wake of the Iraq WND debacle. There was a sense that policymakers were pointing down the street um, and asking for light posts that maybe weren't. So I'm pushing this metaphor way too far, but I think the idea comes through um, that it's really hard to know what that line is between undue political pressure and political bias and just simply being responsive to policymakers. And so I think rather than giving an answer at this point, I'll just simply flag that this is an inherent tension in the work of intelligence analysts. Okay, uh, policy uh, or intelligence analysts should produce work that is timely. Analysis must be disseminated in, a time, in time for it to be actionable by customers. Analytic elements, this is so not, not analysts, but the analytic elements, the sort of bureaucratic uh, structure within analysts are working, uh, have the responsibility to be continually aware of events of intelligence interest, of customer activities and schedules, and of intelligence requirements and priorities in order to provide useful analysis at the right time. So this is a more of a managerial set of tasks that the managerial function is to make sure that what the analysts are producing is the kind of stuff that the customer is asking for and getting it to them in a way that, in a, in a time frame that will actually be helpful. 
uh, based on all available sources of intelligence information. So analysis should be informed by all relevant information available. Analytic elements should identify and address critical information gaps and work with collection activities and data providers to develop um, access and collection strategies. And so there's there's two parts to this actually. Um, it's short, but there's, there's two parts. And so one of those parts is that uh, you should be pulling um, all relevant information available um, and identifying gaps. So th those are the kind of things that analysts are doing, right? They're gathering together the pile of information and sitting down and working through it all in a systematic way and saying, hey, wait a second, these are the things that, that are missing. These are the things that I'd like to, to be able to have, but I just, I don't have this document in front of me. And then you turn to the analytic elements, again, the sort of bureaucratic superstructure around the analyst and the job of those uh, analytic elements, it's really clunky wording, um, is to figure out the collection piece, right? To go back to the collectors and say, hey, can we get this? This is the kind of information that we want. Is this available? Is, do you have access to this? What would we have to do to be able to get that and develop those strategies for how to make sure that the next iteration through the analysts have the information that, that's missing this time? Okay, implements and exhibits analytic tradecraft standards. And so there's a bunch of these. Um, I'm actually gonna separate them out into a, a second video because I think there's like nine of them and there's a lot to say about them, but I wanna introduce them here because these are talking about what kind or what an analytic product should look like, right? The kind of things that analysts are producing, what are the qualities and the properties of that? So the properties, it should properly describe quality and credibility of underlying sources, data, and methodologies, right? Cite your sources, make sure uncertainty and unknowns about those sources are communicated clearly. Properly express and explain uncertainties associated with major, major analytic judgments. And so there's language about how to talk about probabilities, how to talk about our levels of confidence about the judgments we're making, and that's an important part of this. Properly distinguishes between underlying intelligence information and an analyst's assumptions and judgments. So like I said, oftentimes we're working with information that is not complete or there's a lot of uncertainty around it and we sort of have to work through that using our own assumptions and, and judgments and the models we're building that should be made clear to policymakers that we're separating out here's information I have that we think is solid um, or here's how solid I think it is versus here's how I put that information together to form a judgment and, and, and the assumptions that are involved in that are over here so that you can separate those out and know what's what's me <laughs> versus what's the data incorporates analysis of alternatives. There's a variety of ways that this can be done, but again, it's sort of pinging that that analysis of competing hypotheses method is going to be a favored method um, under these new standards. Uh, demonstrates customer relevance and addresses implications. Um, information should be relevant to our consumers, right? The purpose of drafting these things is that they'll be useful. Uh, uses clear and logical argumentation that's great, explains changes to or consistency of analytic judgments. So again, going back to the idea that as new information comes in, we should be updating our analysis and that should be communicated clearly to policymakers. Something has changed, pay attention, or things haven't changed. And here's why we can think that old judgments continue to remain effective. Uh, makes accurate judgments and assessments agree with that 100%, uh, incorporates effective visual information where appropriate. Okay, so we've got all of these different pieces uh, that are sort of directing us for how we should be producing uh, analysis and what that should look like. And again, there's a lot more to unpack here. And so I will tackle that in a subsequent video.